and hello fellow tankers. David, here with my first episode of World of Tanks. Space Bandit couldn't be here with us today, therefore you will have to settle for a lesson in history with me. This may not be as enjoyable as hearing Space Bandit talk, but it will have to do. If you don't like history I suggest that you go take a hike, and come back when my buddy's face is back in shape to narrate the next video for you. Nevertheless, let's not waste any time talking about stupidities and get right into the meat and potatoes. Today's history lesson is about the FV-215B183 aka the Death Star. After witnessing the debut of the Soviet IS-3 heavy tank at the end of World War II, the Western armies were, safe to say, a little bit worried. As such the British immediately began work on new vehicles that could combat this new threat. In 1950, work began on the FV-215. This was a little known British heavy gun tank project that never left the conceptual phase. It was said to be an IS killer, and would no doubt have sent a very cold shiver down the spine of Soviet tank crews. This vehicle is known by many names, FV-215 Heavy Anti-Tank SP No. 2, Gun Tank No. 2, or simply FV-215. The design phase began November 1950 after a meeting was held by the War Office to determine just what vehicle would be suitable to carry the new QF 183mm 7.2 inch L4 cannon. Morries were first to be given charge over development, but this was later handed over to Vickers Armstrong. Design The design team chose to base the vehicle on the chassis of the FV 200. The chassis underwent minimal modifications, the largest change being the repositioning of the turret to the rear of the vehicle. This was to avoid the extremely large main armament hanging over the bow too far. The driver also remained at the front right of the tank. The large box-like turret mounting the 183mm 7.2 inch main armament, in theory, had a full 360 degrees of traverse but this was not recommended on sloping services. It could only fire through our 45 degree angle left and right. Despite its large size, there was still not enough room inside the turret for a working loading mechanism. As such, the predicted 6 rounds per minute would have been a hopeless fantasy. It is expected that this vehicle would need two loaders to service the weapon, but even so, the desired loading time would likely have gone unreached. The vehicle had a limited ammunition loadout, also likely due to space constraints, carrying only 20 separately loading rounds in total, 12 of which were ready rounds. The combined weight of charge and projectile was 104.8 kilograms. Not an easy task for the two loaders. Defensive armament consisted of a Browning .30 caliber machine gun, supplied by 4,000 rounds. It was mounted in a small structure on the forward right of the turret roof. It was able to aim up and down a few degrees. There was also 1.50 caliber 12.7 mm M2HB on an AA mounting above the loader's hatch, on the right rear of the turret. The armor thicknesses of the vehicle changed throughout its development. As it was intended as a relatively long-range vehicle, its reliance on armor would have been minimal. Nonetheless, it was given similar armor properties to the Conqueror. The upper plate varied from 125 to 152 mm or 4.92 to 6 inches thick. The side plates were 50 mm or 1.97 inches thick with spaced armor in front. The turret had the thickest armor on its front. It was 254 mm or 10 inches thick. The vehicle was designed to be powered by an 810 horsepower Meteor MK12 engine, with a power to weight ratio of 12.3 horsepower per ton. This would propel the 65 ton vehicle to 32 km per hour or 19.8 miles per hour. The L4 was designed to be chambered for only one type of ammunition, Hesch High Explosive Squashed Head. 
one can only imagine the devastation an explosive shell of this size would cause to a hostile vehicle. Whether the shell penetrated or not, the concussive force of such an explosion on the crew inside would be deadly in its own right. The 183mm was tested in live fire trials against a Centurion and a Conqueror. In two shots, the 183 blew the turret clean off the Centurion and split the manlet of the Conqueror in half. What? Although the FV215 project never came to be, the Mores company was the first to be tasked with building a full-scale model followed by two prototypes, one to test mobility, and for armor testing. In June 1954, Vickers Armstrong became the owners of the contract and were given the same task. January 1957 marked the end of the road for the SPG, even though the requested scale model was finished, and 80% of the blueprints were ready and waiting for further development. The intended role of the vehicle had been overtaken by increasing development of ATGMs and to tank guided missiles. These granted the same, if not better, anti-armor capabilities, with the experiments ultimately culminating in the Morkana and Orange William missile systems. The only 183mm armed vehicles to reach prototype phase were the FV4005 Stage 1 and Stage 2. Both vehicles were based on the Centurion MBT. The Stage 1 featured an exposed gun with an automatic loading system, on a limited traverse ring. The Stage 2 featured a fully enclosed turret, with a full 360 degree traverse. As the loading system wouldn't fit in the turret, it was removed. Just one vehicle was used for both prototypes. The Stage 2 now sits outside the Tank Museum in Bovington. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoy this history lesson with David. Although I'm not as bright, pleasant and likable as Space Bandit might seem to be, I do what's needed to bail out his sorry ass. Without me this video would not be possible, therefore Space Bandit is in deep debt. Anyway, enough of chit chat. That's it for today, enjoy the rest of the 6k run, and as Space Bandit would say, happy tanking, until next time, David, checking out.